This is Harrison Boyle from your New England Free Jacks, and you're listening to the Jacks Rangers podcast. Huzzah! Huzzah! Huzzah, Rangers! This is Phil Harris here at the Jacks Rangers Show, broadcasting from the beautiful Manchester, New Hampshire, in the Granite Outpost. Wanted to say we are almost there. We have made it until less than two weeks until the start of MLR 2022. Give yourself a round of applause. We've made it. We're almost there. The finish line is in sight. We're going to have rugby for at least 16 weeks after this, so super exciting. Once we get to that first kickoff, on February the 5th for our Free Jacks. That'll be down in New Orleans. Extremely excited. We've got a huge episode for you with multiple segments and a huge interview. And I do mean huge. We've got the big boss. I'll explain everything after that theme music. Kick that MF and mule. Woo! It is in the air, Rangers. We are ready for battle on February the 5th. Preseason Part 2 has arrived. Welcome to Episode 25. We've got quite a bit of content for you this time around. Did want to first mention our sponsor, which is our very own jacksrangers.com forward slash store. Head on over there at some point and get yourself some excellent merchandise from the Jacks Rangers to you. will be delivered to your doorstep. Merchandise that includes two different types of hoodies, a rain jacket, a beanie, several different types of t-shirts, a drawstring bag, I recently got the drawstring bag, guys. It is extremely high quality stuff. I'll definitely be wearing that to our home games. Did want to mention we have modified the logo slightly. We the laces are out. Hashtag laces out. Ace Ventura reference there. Just modified the logo a little bit, guys. Wanted to make it a little bit more cleaner. And I think we accomplished that with the new logo. So make sure you check that out. Our charity, which is Phil's Last Ride, is up to $265. This is all before the season starts. So the idea of this is that we're trying to raise $1,000 before the end of the season. At the end of the season, I will be shaving off this Carolina waterfall that I've been growing, coming in very well right now. We're going to have it throughout the entire season. We're going to get wacky with it throughout the season and the dog days of summer and, you know, do some wild stuff. You'll I'll send pictures and stuff like that through social media. But we did hear from the Eagle, Kyle Sequera, that he is participating in this. Obviously, he has a luxurious full mullet himself, and uh, he will be shaving it off completely if we reach $1,000. So we'll definitely get that on video. I think, you know, we'll coordinate and do it together at a barbershop uh, and and put that video on social media for you guys to see if we hit $1,000, that goal of $1,000. That is, of course, benefiting the Massachusetts Youth Rugby Organization. Hopefully we'll get there off to a strong start, right? We're up to $265 before the, the season even kicks off. So hopefully we'll reach that goal. Wanted to mention the lineup before we get into anything here. So first we will have our Outriders predictions part two. Going to be talking about what we think our record will be. That was myself, Dave, and Chris Lind in on that segment. Going from there, we'll have the Eastern Conference major transactions. And then we'll talk about our own team's backs transactions and roster breakdown for our back line. And then we threw in what we call the North American 15. So from our roster, we're trying to put together a 15 team exclusively of American and Canadian. So that was a bit of fun there. And finally, the big boss, the original Free Jack himself, the founder and CEO of the Free Jacks organization, Alexander Mags Magleby was able to join me for about 15 minutes. He answers some burning questions that we have here in the off season. Very great, you know, awesome interview always with Mags. He brings it, baby. So I was excited to have him on the show. We appreciate him coming onto the show for round two. So yeah, that is episode 25. Just roll right through here with the segments and I'll close up shop at the end. I appreciate you guys listening. Let's get right into the episode here. Woo! Huzzah, Rangers! This is Phil Harris again here at the Jacks Rangers Show. I am joined by Dave McVeigh and also Chris Lynn. The Outriders are back once again in episode 25. This is preseason part two. So at this point, we've still got way too early predictions to talk about, and mainly we're going to be discussing what is the win-loss record for the Free Jacks going to be 
we don't know who's starting. We don't know what the coach's preferences are. We don't really know what their tactics are going to be. We don't know any of that. Um, we're just going to throw stuff on the wall and hope it, it, hopefully it sticks. And, you know, we're just having fun, guys. It's just way too early predictions. So here we go. Um, I will start with my thoughts, my overall thoughts and uh, the record. So my feeling about this season is prior to it getting started is it feels good to be good. And I think on paper, we are good. If you look up and down this roster, we've got those guys that come that are coming in that have, you know, super rugby experience or came from great academies to prove themselves. And the guys that are retained, we know what they can do. And what they can do is a lot. <laughs> this is a good team on paper. Um, there's some question marks with the center position and the coaching staff coming in. Not to say that, you know, we're not, I'm not trying to disrespect them. You know, they've had successful careers other places, but they've never done it at the MLR level. Um, our assistant coach isn't even here yet at this point. Uh, Mike Rogers is still in New Zealand, as far as I know. So does that play a factor into the, the, um, the season? I hope not, right? Um, another thing that is kind of making me a little bit weary is last year with the away games, we didn't win enough of those games to put ourselves into a playoff position, right? Everybody wants to point to that NOLA game and say, well, this is why we didn't make the playoffs or this is why we got pushed out of the, the playoff route. Well, it really comes down to ultimately, you know, obviously we should have won that game at home, um, but we didn't win enough games on the road to put ourselves in really good contention to make the playoffs. So my big question mark is, can this team win on the road? Um, it's going to be difficult. I think the first four games are away games. Some of them are on the West Coast. So this team has to scratch and claw and figure out a way to execute well on the pitch in these away game situations early in the season. You got to take like two out of three uh, or three, excuse me, three out of four or something like that. Put yourself into a good position. I'm not really worried about the home games per se. I know that it's going to be an intimidating atmosphere um, at Veterans Memorial Stadium, Fort Quincy, as we like to call it. Um, if we execute well on the road, I think this team can really, you know, turn a lot of heads. There's a lot of people that I saw um, the, the commissioner of the National Collegiate Rugby Championship. He's kind of a um, I think he has a show on the uh, the rugby network. He was predicting us like 10th out of 14 as like the, the preseason power rankings. And you know what I did? Like, I don't think anybody else responded to him, but I just did this like. These people are way off on the free jacks, man. I don't know what it is. Is it just like the Boston market isn't big enough for these people? I don't know. Are we in like New York shadow? Um, I don't know what it is, but they are just, they're not respecting us at all. So my best case scenario is that we're going to win 12 games this season. Okay. Um, and again, you know, way too early predictions. Don't know really what, what the hell we're talking about. It's just a feel. Right. I feel like we're going to win 12 games as long as we're winning some of these away games. I think that, like I said, the home games are going to take care of itself. Worst case scenario, 10 wins. OK, but here's what's so good about that. I mean, it's still good news to talk about, even if you only win 10 games. We still have an opportunity to make the playoffs if we don't win 12 games because the playoffs have been expanded this year. So that's pretty encouraging. Um, so with that rant, uh, I'm going to throw it to Dave. What you got? Yeah, so I um, this was kind of an interesting analysis challenge because, like you said, who who really knows? Um, I I do think that uh, one or two people who've made early power rankings have slept on the free jacks a little bit. I think part of the reason is what Tom Kindly um, and Scott Matthew and Mike Rogers are doing personnel wise. That's I think a little bit different than what some of the other teams are doing where. Um, they're targeting uh, more veteran, let's say, international players with those international slots where I feel like the Free Jacks, there's really the focus on, on upward trajectories and young players with a lot of promise and then skilled coaches who can really tap into that potential. Um, that it, on paper doesn't look as impressive as, you know, throwing – 15 all blacks caps on a you know on a team together right? right um i didn't look so much at, at best case and worst case but i broke the season up kind of in two different ways so the first way i looked at it was the first four games which are all on the road 
the next six games, which are three and three road and, and home. Mm-hmm. And then the final six games, which is one game on the road, five games at home. And so I said, looking at that, um, free jacks, if the, the position we can finish in, I think, is if we can get half of those first four games, so two wins out of the first road trip, if we can get half of the next six games, so three more wins on the half and half home and away series. Um, and then five of the last six games where we are almost entirely at home, we just have one trip up to Toronto. That would be a 10 and six finish, um, which matches your worst case scenario. Um, and then I kind of wasn't sure if that methodology was any good. So, you know, for the sake of science, I split the season up a second time and I looked at it as um, the first seven games and then the last nine games. In the first seven games, there's six games on the road and only one home game, which is a little bit dire. But then the last nine games, once we come back from Atlanta, who we play on March 26th in Atlanta, once we come back from that trip, we only have to go to New York and Toronto for the remainder of the season. All right, those are our two away games. So they're East Coast games. The other seven matches are all at home and so i think that if we can win four of those first seven that would be dropping a few games right we're going to face la on the road austin on the road atlanta on the road those are tough teams um if we can win four of those and then eight of the last nine in that big home stand say we maybe only drop one game Mm -hmm. um the schedule is pretty good uh, I think not every team in MLR has has improved that much over the off season, um, and maybe particularly the Eastern Conference where things have been a little bit hectic. There's been a lot of churn in a lot of the teams, um, so I think it's possible that we can win eight of those nine last games um, and see where we are. So that would be twelve and four, which matches your best case scenario. <laughs> so we are I in agreement that. on our numbers. I love that. Um, man, even that coming awesome. at it with uh, totally different methods. So absolutely. So there's stark contrasts. You know, Chris, we'll get to you in a second. But you know, yeah. as all as always, this show is like I'm good vibes only. Uh, RFC over here, just like all emotion. I'm not thinking about like you know this team, this team, but all of that. But Dave's over here like, you know, he's got his protractor out and just like, <laughs> but we're coming up with the same numbers, right? It's so awesome. Chris, what you got yeah. for us, brother? Dave's like a chess player running. He's running the chess engine. He's checking all the variations. He's like, but I found this novelty over here. So wait, let's explore that. And then goes down a deep rabbit hole. I love it. I'm a huge fan. I'm here um, for it, man. So I didn't really do the best case, worst case scenario. Mm-hmm. I think that the free jacks are going are, are gonna to run 10 and six. Okay. And I think they're going to, but, but here's the thing, the, the number record, you know, how many times did the Patriots not have a great record, but when regular season record, but when the Super Bowl, because it was all about when you get hot, when you go on a streak um, and whatever. So I'll kind of start backwards and then work my way to the beginning of the season. I think that they're going to have a very, a ser- a very serious late season letdown this year. I think they're going to fall to Toronto. Uh, and fall to NOLA uh, in weeks 14 and 15. They're just going to stumble there at the end. Um, however, however, comma, I think that they're going to be pretty strong throughout like the middle of the season. So I think they're going to stumble at the end and stumble at the beginning. So I think that while you can go on really strong streaks, I think you're always, I mean, it is rugby. and I think you're always subject to, to a loss here or there. Uh, I think Atlanta is going to be particularly strong this year. I know we split the difference with them last time, but I think that they're probably, if, if I'm not, if I wasn't a free Jacks fan, I would pick Atlanta to win, to win the East. And then obviously New Jersey is going to be hot garbage. Uh, That's French for garbage. So uh, I think we're going to sweep them, but I think we're, you know, I think we're going to struggle against Atlanta and that's going to be our mid, those are going to be our only mid season stumbles. And we we play them in week seven and and week 13. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I just think they're going to get bias uh, just because we're not the way I was looking at the schedule. And then we have, I don't think we've ever beaten NOLA as well, which so we, and we, that's where we start the season at NOLA. So I think we're going to drop that one. And then this is whack. What is the league thinking? I know it's cold, but we're playing the Giltinis for the second year in a row when we're coming off freezing 
Yeah. I mean, I know the guys train indoor in a dome, but it's not the same and all this other stuff. And then we have to go play the defending champions, the weenies, the guillotinis, whatever they are, who cares? You know, we have to go play them in LA again. Why are they not coming to new England? Why is it not later in the season? Uh, you need to answer that question. Kamish. That's, that's a little, uh, I don't like that. Uh, anyway, that's just my uh, two cents. But, and then the last thing I'll say about the 10 and six record is I don't think that, that, you know, we talk about 12 and four. We like to, we like that win column to be significantly larger than the loss column. I think that there's going to be a lot more parity in this league than, 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 than even last season. I think you're going to see a lot of teams at 10 and six. I think you're going to see a lot of teams that are going to be strong and then kind of fall off or stumble against a team. You wouldn't think they would, cause they have a good, they have a good out on the paddock. But I think that the investment in the young up and coming talent is going to give us that staying power. And I think that the free Jacks are going to be a solid 10 and six. I like, and I guess if I had to give it a number without giving, you know, my, I didn't really work out the, I didn't get the, the, I didn't go my Pythagorean theorem out there like Dave and, and extrapolate it to the specific weeks. But if I had to go the best case scenario, I think the best case scenario, this team could be 13 and three and literally just maybe drop to like Atlanta once LA once, and then just have some kind of hiccup somewhere, some rando lot, like we lose to Seattle, like what? And they're probably going to be terrible. Or, and then I think that, you know, unfortunately I still think the Eastern conference is far stronger uh, than the Western conference. I mean, we've, uh, you know, again, New Jersey's garbage, but I think Toronto's coming back with a vengeance this year. I think they're going to be very strong. I think that um, NOLA is going to be strong um, and, and Atlanta and seeing all those teams multiple times, the worst case scenario could get bad. I see us maybe finishing 500. If things, if we get a couple bad breaks and unlucky bounces, which also the game of rugby is subject to. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, yeah, but I, I, I'm seeing 10 and six final answer, Regis. All right. Perfect. Um, so I wanted to comment about a couple things here. One thing, I mean, obviously NOLA has had our number, um, you know, last year, we, I think we're the, the only team that beat us twice is NOLA. Right. Um, so that's kind of a scary first game, but this is one thing that people are not thinking about. It's, it's kind of flown under the radar their head coach, who I believe has been there since the beginning, was either fired, resigned, let go, whatever, about a week ago prior to the team arriving for preseason preparation. So that could be huge with this first game, guys. Um, that's one thing that uh, people aren't really considering. Um, and by the way, we took one of their best players. Thank God this area is so good with higher education, right? Because um, the vampire, his girlfriend, is – studying nursing at BU or something like that. So that's the reason why we were able to poach him from NOLA. So, I mean, we got one of his, their best players. They might be in disarray with their head coaching change all of a sudden that came out of nowhere. So, I mean, when you consider that, I mean, it could be a good first game for us, even though it's down there. Um, with regard to um, uh, the, us having a kind of a bad break with all like four games on the road at the beginning of the season, what if I told you that our owners specifically wanted that, right? It seems like kind of a disadvantage, right, where we have to go on the road for these four games. But what, what I think that they're thinking about, and again, I don't, uh, even though I have an insider shirt on, I'm not really an insider. They don't really tell us this kind of stuff at all, right? But what if they're lobbying for these games not to be at home early on in the season? Because even though all three of us would go to the game because we're psychos and be out there in sub degree, you know, uh, you know, minus five degree weather and watch the free jacks regardless there's not enough of us out there that are going to do that. So they're, they're, you know, they're looking at ticket sales and that sort of stuff in the, in the early part of the season. Now, you know, uh, St. Patrick's Day is a no brainer, right? I mean, regardless of it's going to be snow on the ground, people are going to show up because it's rugby, it's alcohol. You know, I don't have to explain that to these people that are listening, but um, other than that, I, I really think these first four games, it seems like a bad break for us. It's happened two years in a row now, and it might've been three years in a row, right? If you're considering the pandemic season, Mm, yeah, whatever. Uh, however, that math works. But we were on the road, you know, pretty much the entire the entire time in the in the COVID uh, shortened season too. So that's that's a factor. I mean, I, it seems like you know we can look at this and like, oh, it, it's such a bad break for us. But at the same time, like, I think it's been engineered that way, and I don't think that's going to change, unfortunately. So ultimately, it comes down to, like I said, the question mark is 
can we, you know, fight, scratch, and claw wins on the road at the beginning of the season to set ourselves up? This country is vast, man. It's got to be hell on your body as a rugby player to go 3,000 miles and play the best team in this league, uh, L.A. I'm not going to call them their own name. F that. Which is why they should be coming back to play us in the bone-chilling cold, diehard fans only, get out in the stands, (laughs) freeze out L.A., send them packing, and chalk up a nice early season win. What are they thinking? Nah, I'm just, I'm salty about that. I, I don't mind playing LA, but they just, they should just be later in the season. Like giving us the defending champs twice in a row early yeah. season. Get out of here. Yeah. 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 I, I would like to see LA in March, right? Yeah. Like that's the, that's the solution. The schedule is by design, not accident. I agree with Phil. Like it's, we're, we're going to see this every year. First four or so games on the road. Um, I, you know, as a season ticket holder, I don't hate it as a, you know, coach, uh, a competitive mindset. It's not as good, but in terms of the product, the market, and I don't think it's a huge problem either. Um, being at home for, you know, seven of the last nine games, that's awesome. Um, and so as a spectator, I like that. I enjoy being able to go see rugby almost every weekend once the weather's nice, you know, yeah. Um, but, uh, competitively it does set up a a situation where, like you said, Phil, I think scratch and claw is right. That's why I say, if we can, if we can hit 500 on these early road trips, then that puts us in a really good position to basically, you know, defend this house for the rest of the season as we are mostly at home and can, um, you know, so far we have a really good, really good track record there. Um, and we've heard players talk about how, you know, impactful it is to play at home, feeling feeling the field shake as fans are stomping at Veterans Memorial Stadium in Quincy. Yeah. I mean, that is awesome. That's really cool. And uh, um, I'm looking forward to it. But I do agree, Chris, give us L.A. in March in the cold. Yep. I want them to be our first home game. Let's do it. Let's do it. L.A. home opener. Bre- breaking news. This just in. Your guy, Chris, fellow outrider, uh, I was looking at, I was like, hmm, what are the other cold weather teams doing? So we don't care about New Jersey. Forget about them. They're in a trash can somewhere all yeah. season at the bottom. They're still of the looking barrel. for a field. <laughs> yes, they're still looking for a field and a name. Yet I actually, they're, um, yeah, it, they changed their website name to rugbynewyork.com. Uh, so that was, that's, that's a change. But moving, moving right along here, Toronto actually has – LA at home week two in February. Interesting because the next week they're playing our free Jacks at home back in LA. So that down and back to good old Toronto might give us a glimmer of hope. Maybe they're tired. Maybe Toronto beats, beats the hell out of them. And uh, after they get frozen out and then, and then we take advantage and sweep in. So who knows? Maybe, maybe I should have done that. I should have whipped out that protractor and, you know, (laughs) Started doing some algebra or something. I don't know. I failed math. I'm not. I'm not a math guy. Me so. either. Bro. It's all right. The big. The big brain lives in all of us. Yeah. Exactly. You uh, get me hooked on it. I'm, I'm, di- delivers. I'm diving deep, Dave. I'm like Geronimo, I, but only instead of diving, I'm more like cannonball. Cannonball. I'll, I'll check on or you. Be- or, hour, belly <laughs> or belly flop. Or belly flop. Um, so, you know, just real quick, you know, with regard to Atlanta, um, our, our, our good friend, uh, David from the Scrum of the Earth podcast, when I was on there talking about this sort of stuff, he had said, well, maybe Atlanta, you know, you know, maybe they kind of um, punched above their weight last year. Uh, maybe they're not going to be as good. I don't I don't buy that at all. I wish I could buy that because, you know, as a at heart uh, Charlotte guy, um, I hate Atlanta that they have a stupid name as well. I'm not let them off of the hook for that. But that team is legit. I don't care. You know, you can say that they're overrated or whatever. They're going to be in the mix at the end of the year for sure. Uh, Scott Lawrence down there, you know, they have a strong connection with Life University. They're going to be somewhere thereabouts at the end of the season. I don't think they're going to have a down year this year at all um, with regard to Atlanta. Um, The big question mark in my mind is how's Toronto going to do? Are they going to be at home? If they are, watch out. Watch out, man, because that team is legit. Um, I think, you know, when we're talking about the teams in the East, it seems like we're pretty even. I don't like to give New Jersey props at all about anything, 
but they've gotten better guys. Like their 10 is legit from Houston. He's finally out of that, um, that Garbaggio situation down there with them losing so many games. He's coming in to, you know, kick ass and take names. They re-signed um, Andy Ellis. They got that kid from uh, Atlanta. That's uh, a USA prop chance, whatever his last name is. Um, they're going to be, they've gotten better too. So, yeah. I mean, I don't want to give them Chance any credit. Chance right? Yeah, there you go. I don't want to give yeah. them a lot of credit, but they're going to be they're going to be somewhere around there, unfortunately. I hope we beat them twice. That's that's my my goal with those guys. Um, you know, but uh they're they're going to be around. They're going to be around somewhere. Yeah. Like, when it all they're, ends. They have two of the best meat sticks in MLR, I think. Big big guys who, you know, you you just point them at the forwards on the other team and say, all right, crush, crush those guys. You know, the, the dudes who are so draining Jason Dam or Dom, I think it is. And Johan Momsen, Mm -hmm. um, a lock and an eight man. And, uh, I mean, those guys are absolute trucks, you know, they, they drop it into first gear and will just grind you up. Um, and that's always going to be, uh, a difficult match. Um, I agree that their coaching situation down in Atlanta is really pr- pretty good. And, um, I mean, we saw we, – we beat them in Quincy, that final match. Uh, yep. But anybody who was there, anybody who watched the match could tell what a physical effort yep. that was mm-hmm. from the Free Jacks team, defensively especially, those big, big double tackle uh, stands on the uh, goal line where just over and over and over the guys had to dig really deep to stop those power runners. And Atlanta's, you know, it's good. They're going to bring it again next year. For sure. Really good compliments for the fourth best team in the East at Rugby, <laughs> Rugby United, New Jersey. I, I see them as a solid number four. We got our New England Free Jacks at number one. Yeah. Uh, the, the Rattlers or whatever. I don't know who that is. They're, they're, they're a number two. And then yeah. we'll go with our Toronto guys, number three. And, okay. uh, New Jersey. New Jersey. And well, actually, no, you know what? We'll put them at number five. I, I'll give Noel the nod. Just, <laughs> just because. Love that. Just because rough. Noel, Noel at least can party probably better than them. So that's true. You know, Nola can party. It's a dangerous oh. away trip. Can you imagine? Cool. I mean, I, not no slight to the MLR guys. They're professionals. I'm sure that it is not an actual problem. But boy, we all we've all played club rugby. Can you imagine taking a team to New Orleans and Good trying God. to put anything resembling a competitive weekend on the table? Oh my oh, gosh. God. Talk about Maybe pushing we have boulder to uphill. Watch out for the week after Nola, though, because they might still be hung over on the way back. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Woo. Yeah. Plus they yeah. got they got Mr. Younger down there to show them the ropes. They're like, no, this bar is really killer. I trust me. I've been here. It's like, oh. Oops. <laughs> yeah, the vampire doesn't get hung over, but maybe some of our guys do. That's that that's a problem. That's a problem. Well, boys, uh, any closing thoughts on the way too early predictions, the overall record, anything on your mind before we <clears throat> head into the season? Um, just what we alluded to, uh, earlier, uh, Chris was mentioning that we all like those big, you know, we like a big number in the win column, but what matters, especially this year is just making it to the postseason. Once you hit the postseason, everybody's, well, everybody's not equal anymore. Cause there's a first round buy um, for the top ranked team in each division. And then there'll be a play in where the number three, and number two in the East will play each other. And the winner of that will play the number one. And then same in the West, the two and the three will play each other. The winner of that will play the number one. And then the winner of those semifinal games will combine and we'll have a championship. So, um, the you know, if the playoff structure was the same this uh, last year as it will be this year, we would have seen the Free Jacks in the, in the playoffs. Yeah. Um, and that's what that's what real not, you know, could have, would have, should have. But uh, that's the most important thing i think it's a good change um it's one that fans should just be aware of um as we start looking at the season picture as a whole um and uh i'm i feel really good about the free jacks uh being there and we know that they can beat uh any team in the mlr we've seen them do it to just about everybody uh and they certainly have played in a way that shows that like chris said there's a lot of parity um and I, I'm confident in this team going up against any team in the league. Yeah, that 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 segues. That, that was what I was thinking. That was my final thoughts overall. Like, I'm excited because you know, regardless of whatever uh, the win loss record for the Free Jacks ends up being, I think that um, Tom Kindly and company have built 
a very exciting team. And I'm, I'm just excited to watch these guys play. I'm excited to maybe see some of these younger players like the draft picks or, or the, that local product, uh, you know, Cam Davidovitz, shout out Plymouth State Norseman. I'm, I'm an alumni. Uh, played against Cam, definitely beasted me. The kid's unbelievable. Um, so I'm looking forward to just seeing some entertaining rugby throughout the entire league. And I think that the Free Jacks are going to play an entertaining brand of rugby. Um, I think they're going to be a lot more physical this year. Like South African teams are always physical. So now with the South African coach, I think that brand's definitely coming in. Mm -hmm. And I think there's going to be a lot of parity, which is going to make things interesting down to the wire which means there's not going to be teams like resting players or maybe taking a game off because they can afford to drop to 14 and two instead of finish 15 and one or any of that kind of nonsense. I think everybody's going to be fighting for that spot, which is going to create really exciting content for this show and, and beyond. So, and I think the team is going to grow and the league is going to grow and then it'll just be more exciting from there. And it'll just keep getting more exciting. So I'm excited. Absolutely. Can I say excited any more times? I don't know. We're excited too, Chris. We're excited. We're so excited. <laughs> so, um, you know, my final thoughts is this. It feels good to be good. So the exciting part of this is, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with the season, but you feel good about the roster that's been assembled, and that's TK doing his thing, man. You know, been on the show four times. Big fan of the show. We appreciate what he's done, man. Like, we've got a team that we can be proud of here. I'm sure we're going to see a lot of competitiveness physicality and grit on this team that is what boston loves and i think this team on paper has delivered that it's just a matter of execution on the pitch so it feels good to be good um what else i got for you um oh yes minimum expectation i don't know if i've already said this earlier you know i i can't remember but it the minimum expectation of this team should be to make the playoffs and then see what happens i don't care if it's you know the number one seed or the third seed Get your ass in the playoffs, and we'll see what happens. That is the minimum expectation. This is Boston, guys. This isn't, you know, Kansas City. This isn't Charlotte. You know, this is a championship city. And, you know, if you're not contending for championships, you know, you're a bunch of losers, right? That's kind of how this area is. And if you want to attract non-rugby people, they expect to see something special on the pitch, right? You know, you you, you got to be in contention. You know, there's got to be some sort of mix here where we're close. If we're not there, we're close. And if we're there, by God, let's go get a championship. So that, that's really what it comes down to. I hope to see the MLS, the MLR Cup um, in Boston, in Quincy at the end of the year. Who knows if that's going to happen, but by God, get into the playoffs. That's what needs to happen. Yeah, I want to. I want to march down Hancock Street with that shield. Hell yeah! Like, Hell yeah! Let's let's do it. Let's let's bring it to Quincy, and and to Boston. Boston can participate too. I'm not like a Quincy guy either. I just love the idea. Of like, <laughs> yeah, I feel like they're really taking a little ownership of this. You know, Quincy, which people from around Boston probably haven't even heard. You know, the name or just know vaguely of it as a suburb. But it's yeah. it's important. Quincy was a colonial town. It's where you know that the home you know the city of presidents city of president two u.s presidents from quincy yeah. um is it, you know, isn't it the it, site of the first dunks yes it uh, is. yeah it must yes, be it stop is. and that's shop huge guy head, that's huge, that's huge yeah, yeah yeah stop and shop headquartered there we're talking about real new england culture um so i i think it would be really obviously really cool to win it to win a championship yeah. um and I agree. Make the playoffs, see what happens. That's about what Boston fans expect. And I think that's what the leadership of this team expects too. Yeah. I think they have set a high bar for themselves. For sure. Um, with that, we've got one word. Three, two, one. Huzzah. 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 Woo. Huzzah, Rangers. This is Phil Harris again here at the Jacks Rangers show. I've got my buddy Dave McVay here as well, the outrider himself. Big brain Dave, Diamond Dave, is here with us uh, right now. So I wanted to mention what we're going to talk about real quick before we dive into anything. Right now, we're going to discuss the Eastern Conference, our opponents, our rivals in the Eastern Conference, their major transactions, one forward, one back from each team. Dave, how the hell are you? I'm good. How are you? Not too bad, my friend. So I guess I'll start this thing off, you know, going south to north here. I've got the three southernish teams. I think that's pretty appropriate. Um, so we'll start off with NOLA. So this is New Orleans, of course. Um, I picked forward Matt Harmon. You know, the obvious choice is Cam Nolan, right? I mean, he's kind of the yep. 
our USA Eagle, multi-cap Eagle, um, the leader of that team. But I, I kind of wanted to go in a different direction because everybody kind of knows about Cam, uh, Cam Nolan or Dolan, excuse me, if you're you know familiar with USA Rugby at all. Um, this guy, Matt Harmon, he's very recognizable on the pitch. He's got that like Viking vibe to him uh, with he his does. hair and whatnot. This is his second year of a three-year contract. He has been retained by New Orleans. Um, he is 26 years old from Illinois, five foot 11, 250 pounds, played in 14 mat- matches with NOLA last season, so they rely on him uh, at the prop position. He made his USA Eagle debut uh, last year against England. He won the one, uh, excuse me, the D1A national championship with Life University, so he's a Life University product, as many of these players are. Um, versatile front rower. Uh, so he can play both prop positions and hooker, which seems extremely rare. I know that we've talked about with our team specifically about, you know, guys being be able to do the loose head and the tight head prop. But you don't hear too much about being able to do all uh, three positions in the front row. Yeah, all three is pretty, pretty rare and, um, you know, even more rare to find somebody who can do it. And I'm assuming that he, you know, he really can play all three of those at an MLR level. Yeah. You know, that's huge. That's that's. Sure. Um, tells you a lot just about his natural sense of poise and balance in the front row that he can adjust to all those different slots. Yeah, it's super impressive. Um, so he is my forward pick. The back is a guy that some people will recognize, especially with the name J.P. Duplessis. He is in his second year of a four-year contract. He is 30 years old. He's a center from South Africa. Six foot one, 210 pounds. At the time of him signing that four year contract, it was the longest contract in MLR history. Uh, prior to that, he had spent three years in San Diego before being traded to NOLA for that basically like a sign and trade. So he got traded there on the, I'm assuming, the understanding that he was going to get a long term contract with New Orleans. Um, he was the MLR back of the year in 2019 with San Diego. San Diego. Uh, played. This guy has been well traveled in his rugby career. He played with the Melbourne Rebels, the Stormers, Montpellier, uh, <laughs> uh, Free State Cheetahs, and Southern Kings. So he's been all over the place as a professional, extremely experienced center from South Africa. Um, you know, again, if you're winning the back of the year um, in MLR, you're a damn good player. Yeah, absolutely. He's definitely a guy to keep an eye out for when we're playing them. Um, he can do it all just about. So the next team on my list here is Atlanta, uh, rugby ATL, as they're also called. Um, and as of today, we have heard, we're recording this on the 21st of January, 2022. We have heard that our free Jacks, or at least the majority owners of the free Jacks have purchased Atlanta, um, which is wild. I would never have thought that they would go after another franchise, but that is what's happened. So, yeah, they're kind of like our little brothers or stepbrothers or redheaded stepchild, whatever you want to call them. They're, they're kind of a part of this organization as, uh, as well in a weird way. Yeah, it's the ownership group that is um, Global Rugby Ventures. They have minority stakes in several MLR teams. They have a majority stake in the Free Jacks. It's my understanding. Anybody feel free to correct us in the comments, wherever you're listening to this. Um, And when the owner of the Atlanta MLR franchise grew ill and passed away, um, someone needed to keep writing checks, right? I mean, that's the simplest way to think about it. Um, If Global Rugby Venture, I'm assuming there were not a lot of buyers clambering to, you know, become the new owners of a business that is trying to pioneer a new sport in a big market. Um, So I'm assuming that Global Rugby Ventures was, you know, the buyer singular, that they were the entity who said, yeah, we will take over writing checks for all those players and coaches and staff and rentals and everything else. So I think of it that way. Um, You know, obviously they're a capital firm. They're trying to make money. That's their goal. Right. But um, I think that more than anything, their, for their investment to be sound in the various MLR teams they are already invested in, they need the league to be stable and to have longevity. And that's what this really is more than anything else. It's people who already have skin in the game, putting a little bit more skin in the game because they believe in MLR. So ultimately, yeah. I think it's a good thing. 
it does mean that much lauded American coach Scott Lawrence has departed, um, presumably over disagreements mm -hmm. uh, or conflicts with the new ownership group. Uh, we don't know where he will land right now. There's a big question mark. Dallas happens to have just lost their coach That's due right. to visa issues. So obviously there's a ton of speculation that Lawrence could end up there. It's also a chance he gets snatched up by one of the franchises that are trying to expand for 2023. He'd be a big get, he knows the landscape and you give him a year to start putting a team together. That could be pretty scary. The rumor is that St. Louis, not Chicago, but St. Louis might be the next expansion team. That is just pure rumors. We don't have any confirmation about that. And I will just say that's, I mean, obviously it's great for the people of St. Louis, you know, good rugby town, right, um, with history. But to if that is the destination, if there's no other teams coming in the league next year or whenever it happens to be, I just wonder how the hell they don't have a Chicago franchise at this point, third largest uh, city in America, huge TV market. But that's, that's a conversation for another day. Uh, let's talk about Atlanta. And you're going to be surprised with my pick with the forward. Um, you're, you might be shocked, as a matter of fact. Um, there's a couple guys that you can pick in this Atlanta forward pack. I mean, they're known for their forwards being powerful and dominant. But uh, I had to pick, and this is a little bit of growth for me as well. I picked Jason Dam. Uh, he is re-signed. He's a 26-year-old back rower from Fort Mill, South Carolina. That's my old stopping grounds, not too far from where I grew up. Six foot four, 245 pounds. Played in 15 mass matches for Atlanta last year, scoring five tries. Uh, played five times for Atlanta in the COVID-shortened season and played for Glendale in 2019. Um, I have to mention he played for Clemson, uh, which was from 13 to 17, winning back-to-back -back ACRL championships. And that's, I, I'm assuming why you would think that I would not have picked him because he uh, represented the university they absolutely hate in athletics, which is uh, Clemson. So. Oh, I was going to compliment you. I was going to say that you managed to make it like five <laughs> sentences of talking about Clemson without saying anything mean about them. Well, it, it's and you really, said Clemson sucks. Yeah, I did. I did say Clemson sucks and I'm not going to take it back. So uh, there's a little bit of growth here, but, you know, some some uh, regression as well. But yeah, I mean, he's a good player, so it's hard to, to leave him off of this list, even though he went to uh, that terrible uh, university in the upstate. But hey, great player. I'm glad that he's resigned with them. And, yeah, it's cool that uh, South Carolinian is, is in Major League Rugby representing. For the backs, I have Harley Davidson, which I believe is the best name in MLR. I mean, there's some rivals to him, but I think far and above, he is the number one gold medalist for best name in MLR Rugby. Uh, 28 years old, wing from Idaho. Five foot nine, 185 plant pounds. He's played in one game last year. Due, and, you know, that was a shortened year for him due to injury. And the COVID shortened season, he played in four games for them. Spent two seasons in MLR with the defunct Colorado Raptors. Life University product, two-time collegiate All-American. Captained um, the team in 17. Played in four collegiate rugby championships, and I'm such a huge fan of that competition. It's a shame that it's not in Philadelphia anymore. There's a lot of wind that you know is not a, not in those sales anymore with the collegiate rugby championship. But when it was around, it was so much fun to go to and be a part of and watch on television and that sort of stuff. Just wanted to throw that in there. But he's a great player. Um, excited to see what he can do uh, this year uh, coming off that injury. And definitely best name in MLR at least until we somebody signs the Leicester Tigers Harry Potter. <laughs> then maybe yeah, maybe harley would have to take uh, second place my girlfriend would immediately love that team whoever signs that guy because she's a huge <laughs> harry potter i mean a great way to build a fan base for sure yeah and so the last uh southernish team that i'll uh talk about here is dc old glory uh the four jameson faanana uh schultz is re-signed he is 25 years old he's a prop from australia Six foot two, 255 pounds, played in 11 games for D.C. last season, played in five games in the COVID shortened season. So, you know, played all the games there, um, played for Houston in 2019. He is a Queensland Reds Academy product, played for Auckland in 17 in the minor 10 level, 
uh, played in Japan in eight, nine, or excuse me, 18 for the Red Hurricanes, and he has six caps with the USA Eagles, so he's a formidable forward there. Uh, great prop experience at 25 years old. Even though he's 25, he's been all over the place playing rugby professionally, so he was my choice for D.C. forward. Um, and I think, you know, people are going to sleep on this guy, but I have a special connection to this guy for the backs there at D.C., um, and I'll explain that in one second. It is uh, Threaten uh, Palamo. He is 33 years old, a center from England, six foot three, 255 pounds, co captain of DC, played in 11 matches last season, scoring. A, I don't think that's right. I wrote down 11 tries, but I don't believe that that is correct. I must have had a typo there. Youngest player in uh, the Rugby World Cup at the time, making his USA senior debut at the World Cup at 19 years old. He has 19 caps with USA Eagles, uh, won the inaugural Collegiate Rugby Championship in uh, 2010 with Utah. That's my special connection to this guy. So um, at the time I was out of college, kind of lost. I was working out all the time with my cousin and we had stopped working out. We're like, I was like, hey, man, we got to watch this new thing called the Collegiate Rugby Championship on TV. It's like rugby being televised by ESPN or, or not ESPN. It was like NBC Sports or whatever. And I was so jazzed up because, you know, you don't really see rugby at that time televised televised on tv during prime time so we turned it on and we were watching i was like cal is so good they're the best team of all time you know california these huge rugby champion tradition blah 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 um and then this guy comes in there with utah and just tears them up in the final game it goes into overtime and he scores two tries in that game so i will forever remember him i actually got to meet him um in ottawa when usa played canada prior to the 15 world cup but he's played professionally everywhere. Um, Baritz, Saracens, London, Welsh, um, Bristol Bears, and the Dragons there and the um, whatever they're calling that uh, league now, the United Championship or whatever it is. URC, yeah, United yeah. Rugby Championship. Newport Gwent Dragons, right? There you go. Yep, that's the ones in Wales there. So, yeah, I mean. That's great. Yeah. He's, he's an incredibly, like, humble and nice guy, too. Yep. So, and I, you know, the rest of these guys might be too, but you've met him, I've met him. And, you know, it, it's, it's always good when you can pick a dude, not just because he's a great player with a, a great history, but also because he's just such a genuinely nice guy. Yeah, for sure. Super uh, humble, kind of shy, you know, but definitely gets the job done on the pitch. I saw him and Danny Tusatala were water boys in the preseason match that would happen like a couple of hours prior to us yep. recording this today. So that was kind of, that's kind of funny. Um, who you got? I have the great white north right now. We are all icebound up here. So New York and Toronto previews. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start off with um, Toronto. We'll save New York for last. Uh, so for Toronto, their signing is Kylie Bailey. He is coming up from NOLA, where he was the captain down there. He is a highly versatile player. He can play lock or anywhere in the back row. Um, he's a workhorse and he's certainly going to be looking to make an impression and he's bolstering a back row for Toronto. That's already pretty formidable, um, with Lucas rumble and, um, uh, I believe De La Vega is back this coming year. I know he was, um, in France, but I think just as a short-term medical joker filling in, um, for teams that had excessive numbers of injuries, just on one of those real short-term contracts. So I believe De La Vega's back for 2022. Um, and that's a pretty scary back row, uh, for the backs. They've signed Matt hood. Who's an Australia sevens player. Um, we've seen how effective sevens international sevens guys can be in this league. Um, I think it's an attacking league where attack tends to be productive and that means you're getting line breaks and sevens players, their whole thing is exploiting a line break. You know, you got You get guys a little bit misaligned and you run the right line and you run the right support line and you score a try. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Matt hood, you could see him really effective coming into the MLR and making an impact. I'll tell you what, um, Kyle looks like he played hockey as a youth. I know he's Canadian, right? He's a Canadian captain international yeah. for them. He looks like he played hockey because he's missing some front teeth there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm just guessing that he played a little hockey growing up. <clears throat> it's a it's a solid tell, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, for New York, uh, I'm going to talk about another flanker who's joining them, Pago Haini. He is coming from L.A., so he just won the championship last year. Mm-hmm. He's one of my favorite players in MLR. I'm kind of bummed that he's on New York now because I love to root for him. Yep. 
Um, and he is just a really hardworking, very clever uh, flanker. He also has some sevens background. Um, and he's the guy who's really good at just spotting those um, little defensive lapses around the ruck and having a little pick and go kind of run. Um, fun to watch. Uh, it's a, not a trade because they've been signed, but going from New York to LA is another high profile flanker, Hanko Hermeshais. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Who is a uh, very hard running, hard hitting back rower, plays for the US national team. Um, so interesting to see Pago go from LA to New York yeah. and Hanko go from New York to LA. Um, I guess good thing those guys aren't on the same team. That'd be a little too scary. Yeah, exactly. Uh, for the backs, Sam Windsor, who who knows 10 years from now, he'll probably still have the Houston Sabercats all-time point scoring record, even though he mm -hmm. just departed for New York, is going to be wearing the 10 jersey or competing for the 10 jersey at least. And he's an Australian player. He's older. He's in his 30s, 34, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, he had a lot of coaching role uh, and kind of academy work down in Houston. So interesting to see what he's going to bring in that capacity to New York as well. Um, but him taking the ball from all black legend Andy Ellis could be a pretty lethal 9-10 combination. So oh, yeah. keep your eye on Sam Windsor there in New York. And if you recall, TK mentioned that we had a we, I mean, as in the Free Jacks, had a conversation with him prior mm -hmm. to him signing with New York. So interesting to to uh, you know that's of note he goes to our rival our biggest rival but yet we had a conversation with him potentially to, to join us that would that you know so uh and, and pago he actually i you know i had mentioned to you i recognized the name but i didn't recognize him from la he was actually with the free jacks prior to us joining the league during those cold war games so that's what yes I that's right yeah. back in 2019 yes, and before that he played for houston yes okay all right, um, so that wraps up the um, Eastern Conference major transactions. So join us here shortly here, still in episode 25, where we will be talking about the roster breakdowns and the transactions for our Free Jack backs. So we're going to say one word to get out of here in three, two, one. Huzzah! Huzzah! Huzzah, Rangers! This is Phil Harris again here at the Jacks Ranger Show. I'm joined by my brother here, Dave McVeigh. He's an outrider. He's a big brain Dave. He's a diamond Dave. Dave McVeigh is here once again. Dave, how the hell are you? I am doing very well, Phil. How are you? Not too bad, my brother. So what we're doing today is we're discussing transactions for the Free Jacks in the back area, in the back room, if you will. So I'm going to start this bad boy off with our only uh, scrum half transaction if you will that has come over from a different team his name is holden they call him the vampire yogurt okay and i actually have some uh bite marks here so he visited me at some point recently i don't recall exactly but there's some bite marks there um so he is 28 years old a scrum half from california five foot ten 185 pounds spent the last four years playing for nola which is in new orleans um, last season, he played in 15 matches and the COVID, in the COVID sh shortened season, he played in four matches and 16 matches in 2019. So this guy is their go-to guy as a scrum half has been the past four years. He's a St. Mary's product. He won three, count them three division one, a championships and was named a 2017 collegiate all American. So what has happened here, and he was on the show a couple episodes back, if you guys want to uh, watch that after this, um, he explained that, you know, everything was great with NOLA, that sort of thing, but his girlfriend is studying to be, I believe, uh, a nurse or at least getting her master's in nursing up here in the Northeast, and for all those that are in the surrounding area, or maybe some folks that are not, um, you know, Boston is one of the best regions of higher education in this country. So we're very fortunate <laughs> that um, his girlfriend chose the Northeast area up here, the Boston area, to continue her edu higher education. And that is how we've gotten the vampire to fly up here uh, to the Boston area. So extremely excited to have him. I mean, we basically, and I know that you're going to touch on this, Dave. I don't want to steal your thunder, but our scrum half room is absolutely stacked. Um, we've got two number ones as far as I'm concerned. If you look mm -hmm. at his resume, this guy is legit. He is a MLR veteran. 
Um, so it's, we're so fortunate um, to have this guy. Yeah. He's legit. And um, I mean, to just turn up basically where he, uh, he just moved, moved to Boston and then let him know that he was available. Uh, he walked on to the mystic practice. He sure did. You know, like any other player showing up to their first practice. Right. Um, just walked up. Oh, how you doing? Welcome to the team. Yeah. Hi, hi. My name, you know, what's your name? Holden. Like no, <laughs> no airs. No, like been right. playing in major league rugby for the last five years. Right. No big deal. Ha ha. Yes. Um, none of that. Just, yep. just, uh, uh, rolled into the mystic practice and you know got in touch with the free jacks guys and now we got him i think two number ones is right we'll talk about it later but what a huge what a huge pickup it really is i mean it, it, we don't want to understate this this i mean this guy's bona fide like he is legit and he has <laughs> joined our team where we already have a legit scrum half so it's just a huge plus for this organization this team so i'm extremely happy and for, and thankful that he has joined us um so uh for one of our centers here by the name of um micah uh lamano or lamano 24 years old center from uh california Six foot one, 225 pounds, played for the San Francisco Golden Gate team uh, in the Pacific Rugby uh, Premiership in 2018. He won Rookie of the Year in the Californian Rugby League in 2019. We're not going to talk about Rugby League on this channel very much. So I think that's probably the extent of how <laughs> what I want to discuss with Rugby League. But he was there. He won Rookie of the Year. Um, scouted at the nine-week USA High Performance Pathways Camp. So that's how he has joined this team. I did uh, have some uh, quotes here from our performance director, Tom Kindly, who's been on the show four times. He says um, that Micah caught our eye as a standout athlete during the uh, site visit of the USA Rugby Development Academy initiative earlier in the year. Uh, he has a great feel for the game, naturally runs great lines, and he is a relentless, uh, he is a relentless ball carrier, making him a weapon with the ball in hand. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, just a young guy uh, that's played both codes at a pretty good level um, and, you know, trying to come over here and make a name for himself. Um, you know, he'll be in the mix at the in the center room and hopefully we'll see him for years to come. Uh, hopefully this kid will get a long term contract and we can see him you know, get better each year uh, as the years go by. So I've got Jack Reeves um, as the uh, a center. For, he's 21 years old from England. He is uh, five foot 11, 195 pounds, joins the J Jacks on a two year loan from Gloucester, which I believe this is the first long term loan deal that the Free Jacks have um, been able to garner here, um, especially with a, uh, an English premiership team. He's been playing rugby since he was five years old. I mean, someday we're going to be able to say that here in the United States, and we're not going to be like, oh, it's no, big, it's no big deal. You know, he's been playing since he's five, but we're nowhere close to that. So, to, you know, when I saw that, I was like, wow, that's impressive. Um, he played for England in the youth, uh, um, excuse me, the under-20s, and he played in the under-20s uh, Six Nations with Harry Barlow. So there's a connection there with Harry. Um, he played in two English Premiership games with Gloucester, and per, uh, per yeah, uh, UN Rumwell, which is our strength and conditioning coach, he said this on the Scrum of the Other podcast. I wanted to give uh, David a shout out from there. He said, uh, Jack looks sharp in workouts and on the training pitch this preseason. So he was, um, Mr. Brumwell was like, he was saying that, you know, Jack is one of the standouts um, coming into the preseason and, and just really showing out. I do have a quote here about Jack from our boy uh, TK. He says, Jack is a physical, hardworking midfielder with huge upside at only 21 years of age. The England age grade product will roll good, excuse me, re reunite with the former, or excuse me, the familiar face of Harry Barlow in New England. So this guy's played at the Gloucester level. He's made two cap, two cap uh, starts with the English premiership there uh, with Gloucester. I mean, you know, a lot of potential. He just on a two-year loan. So, obviously, he wasn't getting a lot of playing time with Gloucester. This gives him the opportunity to play quite a bit here in New England and get some, uh, you know, game time under his belt and then go back over to Gloucester and light the league on fire. Yeah, you these loan deals come about because you have somebody who they really want to get playing time so they continue to improve. Yeah. But – you know, at Gloucester, you've got Scotland international Chris Harris, one of the best centers, especially defensive centers in Europe. 
Um, you've got barely 12 trees. You've got these guys who like Jack Reeves is not going to bump these guys out of the roster and, and get 60 minutes a week, but they want those minutes. So, you know, in this case, the free Jacks are the beneficiaries where he's going to come over here so that he can get some serious game time and can just continue to improve. Um, I think he's a really good get for the free Jacks. I'm looking forward to seeing him on the, on the field this year. For sure, a lot of potential, very promising young man. I mean, if you've been playing since you're five years old and made your way, you know, right there at the Gloucester Academy level and played two games of the Premiership, you're a talented player. Um, so, yeah, very excited about Jack being over here. He was my uh, most looking forward to new signing for the Free Jacks uh, in a previous mm-hmm. episode. So I'm very fired up to see what he can do. Um, from there, I will throw it over to you, my friend. Who you got? Yes. Uh, so I have four guys I'm going to talk about. Uh, Paula Balacana, Wayne Vanderbank, Kale Hodgson, and LaRue Milan. So we'll start with Paula. Um, he has been playing down at Houston. We've talked about him a lot in recent episodes. Just listen um, to those if you're curious. Uh, he is a power running, line breaking uh, wing. Um, he was picked up pretty late in the offseason. I was pretty surprised talking to TK about it. It seems like the league kind of slept on him. Um, his con- I'm assuming his contract with Houston just ran through last season, and then um, there was just kind of a little bit of a dead time where he he didn't get re-signed by them, and um, the Free Jacks moved on it. Uh, TK said to me, I think he was quoting someone else talking about Paula, you know, describing him to TK, yep. but he said, you'd be a fool not to sign this guy three years ago. That's okay. how great Paula Balkan is. Yep. So um, he's going to be really fun. Uh, 5'10", 225. Um, he's a big 5'10", 225. This guy runs like he's about 10% bigger than he is. Um, and he's really fun to watch. Um, Wayne Vanderbank is here on a five-year deal coming out of South Africa which is uh, pretty mind blowing. Um, He is six foot 191. um, And five years to me, what that says is that um, he's, you know, he's either going to be a franchise player or he's going to move on before those five years are up to like a premiership somewhere. Um, Regardless, the organizations think, they, they've got their guy. If you're signing a guy for five yes. years, like they, if he's not around, you know, again, he could go somewhere else. He can go somewhere bigger and better, as you're saying. But if he mm-hmm. doesn't, they expect him to be here as a constant performer, a starter for a long, long time. Right, right. They're expecting five years out of him. I don't want to say that. I don't mean to say that the organization is expecting him to go nowhere. I mean that a five-year deal speaks to the high ceiling he has the confidence that that the organization has that he's going to continue to develop and perform um he is uh let me check my notes um was backline player of the year for the pumas he has a 90 percent tackle completion rate um in addition to being a uh really good attacking player you know he's going to be able to move the ball and make make connections you know the links in the chain like any center um he seems to be a really great fit for the defensive minded game plan the free jacks have talked about bringing this year um so a a a dynamic um big center who can bring it on defense so i think he'll be a good fit um next we have kale hodgson he was our first round draft pick uh born in thailand raised in england moved to Missouri um you know one of these things is not like the other but he played at Lindenwood he was the top try scorer there he's a wing or outside center um he's about the size of Dougie Fife for fans who've seen Fife on the field and you can you know Fife's a big guy he's tall um he accelerates um Kale Hodgson is about that big so size advantage there in the backs you know if you can be big and fast it's good to be both um Dynamic player, I think a lot of upside. I think we'll start to see him working in this season. Um, I don't think he'll be too relegated to the wings, um, as in like the wings of the theater, not the wings of the rugby pitch. Um, I think he'll be able to to get some chances because I think he brings a lot of athleticism and they'll want to see what he can do against teams. Um, Final guy is LaRue Milan. He is Namibian coming in out of South Africa. and he played for the Natal Sharks. He is a Parle Boys High School player. If people remember when I was talking about Herman Agenbach about 
you know, his school, uh, which I believe is Gray's, being one of the best rugby schools in South Africa, the Parle Boys schools are going to be <laughs> mad about that. Um, you know, this is part of that really, really intense boys school uh, rugby that's that's all the development pathway down in South Africa. He was a part of that. He's six foot three. Um, another big guy out there in the centers um, should be really good to watch. Um, I like the size that we have in our back line. I think that can really give you some advantages, not just, you know, everybody thinks of the physical clash, but um, being taller than your opponent, having long arms really lets you manipulate the contact area and make offloads that you wouldn't necessarily be able to make. Um, and if you go, you can Google these guys and watch their highlight videos and you see a lot of that. Yeah. Um, you know, they win the contact, they get two or three more meters, and then they're able to get the ball off to a supporting player yeah. uh, with an athletic move. So um, I'm excited. I think they're all good pickups and sure. can't wait to see them this year. Yeah, super excited about the back line. There's been a lot of turnover, but uh, well, not as much as the forwards, um, but, you know, a lot of <laughs> great uh, potential coming into the room. Um, I did want to mention, let's see here, Patrick Sheely from Dartmouth uh, has been signed on a development contract uh, just recently. So he'll be in the fly half room uh, with Waka and um, Boyle, presumably um, learning from them, you know, uh, great opportunity for this young man to see what professional rugby is like coming from Dartmouth. That's a huge winning tradition type of program, but this is definitely a level up uh, of course uh, in MLR. So excited to see what uh, he can do and, and practice and see how much better of a player he can become um, studying those guys and, and watching what they're doing. And I, I want to say that we might've missed Zachary uh, Bastris. Um, he is. Oh yes. Yes. He is a third. He was the third round draft pick of uh, our new England three jacks. Uh, in the previous draft, he comes from, I want to say, Northern Colorado is the university that he was uh, playing at. He is also a center. Um, so, you know, uh, that center room is is full now. All of those guys are brand new to this team. He can also play wing, if I recall. And the highlight videos that I saw from here, him, he can run like the wind. And he's not exactly yeah. a little guy. You know, again, this back line is, is big boys that just happen to be able to, you know, uh, be quick. Um, yeah, he's six so, two, two fifteen. He's no, you know, he's no spring chicken. He's yeah. he's he's, and I bet in college, you know, in those videos, he he's like a man among boys. Yes, a little yes. bit, <laughs> for sure. You know, the competition that he was playing uh, against, you know. Uh, I don't want to be disrespectful, but, you know, not 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 the uh, premier rugby colleges in the United States, for sure. So um, let's see here. So let's jump over to the backs roster breakdown. Um, scrum halves will go to you, my friend. Yes. Uh, so scrum halves, we alluded to earlier. Um, we have John Poland. He was our go to scrummy for all of last season. Um, fan favorite. Uh, quiet, hard worker is how I would describe him. He's definitely a guy who keeps his head down and plugs away. He's 5'7", 170 pounds, 25 years old. He's actually our youngest scrum half. Um, he was in Ireland under 20 uh, and has been, for me, one of the top scrum halves in the league last season. Uh, and now you add on to that Holden Younger, mm -hmm. who was also somebody that people pointed to as one of the top three, five it definitely top five scrum halves in the league. Um, 5'10", 185. He's 28 years old. Um, he's played for the USA Selects, yep. um, not the USA Eagles, but he's in that national development pathway and that pipeline. Um, he's somebody who's on deck. Um, who knows what the, you know, the World Cup coming up, um, where his future could be. Um, and behind the two of them, you have Sean Yacobian, who also has played for the USA Selects. He's 27, 5'9", 190 pounds. Um, and he was one of the bright spots down at the USA Selects matches in South America, where he did a lot of really great work, like cleaning up bad kicks. You know, just like the ugly stuff that nobody really wants to do yep. and isn't even necessarily part of the game plan. Just like when, you know, when shit is hitting the fan he's the guy who's got a sponge like i gotta say you know usa selects what an awful name can we not come up with a better name for our development squad than they used to be called the eagles also 
which is kind of wild. So then there was confusion about like, well, are you an eagle? Are you an eagle? You're not an eagle unless you're an eagle, but you might've been an eagle. Just call them the Falcons and be done with it. Like this select thing is just so uninspiring. It's just like, ugh, terrible branding. I hate that. But I mean, going, <laughs> going back to what we were talking about, the, the scrum halves room, this is without, I don't care who you throw at me, whatever team you, you want to say, you want to say LA or New York, Nobody beats our scrum half room. There's no shot that you can say that all, your team, whoever that happens to be, only free jack people watch this. But so I'm just basically just talking into the the wind here. But <laughs> there's no better scrum half room in MLR than this team. And it's dumb luck that we have, um, you know, one A and one, you know, one and one here, or one A and one A, whatever, however you want to describe it. Mm-hmm. We've got the best scrum half room. It's not even close. It's amazing that these guys are here. Yeah. And, and, you know, in my opinion, one of the things that is easiest to overlook, but is crucial to winning a championship, making a good postseason run is depth. Depth wins competitions. You're not going to have 80 minutes for your first choice 15 every week of the competition. It isn't going to happen. No team gets that. So what happens when you can't have that? Can you plug in somebody like Sean Yacobian, Holden Younger, John Poland, and really, really have a consistent performance um, across the whole competition? And I think that we can do that. Um, And Scrum Half is such a good it's not good position, such a vital position Mm. where, you know, these guys are running the show. They touch the ball almost every play they're involved in everything. Um, And they're really critical defensively and tactically kicking the ball. They have so many things they have to do. It's a position where you really, of, of all the places, you know, this and fly half are the two places where you want, you know, not just three, five guys who are all competing for that that jersey. So I think this is a really, really good position of strength for the Free Jacks coming into the 2022 season. Um, and I'm excited to see how that scrum half role shakes out. Yeah, um, I, I couldn't agree more. This is so exciting that this is, is happening. And, and depth, depth builds championship teams. Uh, as you were saying, like if John Poland doesn't look like he's into a game for whatever reason, you can always just say, well, we'll just we'll put Holton in this time around and you take a rest or whatever you need to do. Uh, get your mind mm-hmm. off things. And it's not like we're we're going to be like nervous or anxious about, you know, the scrum half position in that situation. We've got this great player who has proved himself time and time again at the MLR level uh, being the top five scrum half. So yeah, uh, amazing, amazing situation. The free Jacks find themselves in and scrum half. Let's also talk about real quick, the fly halves. Um, this is also a stacked room. As far as I'm concerned, you've got um, Waka who I believe will win this starting job as 10. He has proven himself to be the best 10 on this roster. Now Harrison Boyle, a good friend of this show um, for sure. Uh, Waka has just settled into this kicking team and really took command when given the opportunity at 10. Um, as he goes, we go, I believe he is the maestro. I think he will have a great year this year. Um, I picked him to be this team's MVP, so I believe in him at 10. I think we're in a great position with Harrison Boyle being the reserve 10. We, he might even play a little 12 at some point, you know, you know, some fly half so it can fit into 12 if necessary. Uh, the youngster, you know, I was talking about him earlier, Patrick uh, Sheely from Dartmouth, will be able to learn a lot from Waka and Boyle. Uh, this is a, a strength for us in this room with these two guys that could be starters, both of them. Um, you know, we saw Harrison at the beginning of the last season playing 10 and then Waka at 15 mostly. Um, and it was, mm-hmm. it was okay. It, I mean, there was nothing awful about it. You couldn't really circle that and say, there's a lot of problems here. Something needs to be fixed. It's just that Waka is just, you know, he settled better into 10 and that's just the way it was. Unfortunately, that's how the cookie crumbles. I'm assuming that it will be what happens this time around. And I'm looking forward to see that competition going forward um, with this team. Yeah. I think just in terms of looking at the roster, Waka is a 10, just like we don't have other 10s. It seems like he is. I actually really like him at 15. I think it lets him do some things that he is very good at, namely um, uh, counterattacking. I think he's really deadly when he catches those kicks and you, you know you give him a second to look at the line 
Um, I was talking earlier about sevens guys just being line bla- line break exploiters and expert line running uh, line pickers for their runs. Um, and when he gets 10, 12, 14 opportunities to do that a game, I think he's going to capitalize on and you know a few of those and really get some good runs we saw that some last year he also made those from 10 he can pick a good line from 10 too so um he is more of an attack minded minded 10 um which i do like and i think you know that's a strategic choice do you want an attacking a more attack minded you know keep it 10 in waka or a, a game executor um, and Boyle. Boyle also has a really accurate boot. We saw him generate a lot of those uh, little push kick tries, like to Fife late in the season last year and early. Actually, there was kind of a kind of a blurb of him at the beginning and a, a, a some more at the end. Um, the other thing that Walker gets to do at fifteen that he doesn't get to do as much at ten is just open field tackling. His open field tackling is like a coach's dream. That's like you just videotape him and send him to your 15 if you're a coach and say, try and do this. He hits guys right in the legs. He tracks perfectly. Um, He makes an immediate stop every time. Uh, I feel so confident when he's at 15 and somebody breaks the line that he's going to bring them down. Um, So I I do like seeing him back at 15, but I think you're right that probably the look we're going to see is him as the first choice 10 this season. And for everybody out there that might not be as familiar, you know, keep in mind a lot of these players can play multiple positions. Um, Yes. So, you know, when we're talking about what we think, it's it it might be the case that this is this way all season, but probably not. I mean, these guys can be uh, placed anywhere pretty much um, for certain positions, and they can just they can excel regardless of what position they're playing. Um, Let me see here. So you want? I'll go with the centers real quick here uh, before we proceed with anything else. The biggest question mark on this team coming into the season, without a doubt, is the center position. We lost both of our starters. Um, uh, Alecki and Puasa are gone from this team. They're no longer on the roster. TK has signed six new guys that could potentially play center. Um, So if you're bringing in that many new guys, you understand it's an area of concern and you're expecting these guys, at least two of them, to figure it out and take these jerseys and say, these are mine. Uh, the clean clear the team clearly needs to recognize that it is an area of concern. I think they have. Uh, no one of these players have uh, wore 12 or 13 uh, for the Jacks at any point, so they're brand new on the roster. Um, I think you can break it down like this. There are three guys that you could consider development guys, if you will, um, which would be the two draft picks, which is Kale Hodgson and Zach Bastris. Uh, add in USA Rugby High Performance Standout, uh, Mikel Lamano, uh, excuse me. These guys are there to learn how to be professional rugby players and push the other three. Iron sharpens iron, right? So um, if they're pushing the other three, that's perfect. That's exactly what you want uh, in that competitive environment. Um, these other guys have more prof- uh, experience playing, playing professionally, uh, which brings us to those three that have a shot at being the two starters. I think the, cl- the club believes that uh, Wayne Vanderbank will be a starter based on them giving him a five-year contract. He's proven it, at, as you were talking about, at, in the Curry Cup level. So if you're playing high-level Curry Cup, then you can play in the MLR, no doubt in my mind. Um, and I don't think they doubt that either. They gave him a five-year contract, guys. That's one of the main reasons I'm sticking him into a definite starter at the center position. He has uh, you know, a huge resume in the Curry Cup. They signed him to this big contract. Um, and this is where it gets a little bit more murky for me. Who's the other guy? Okay. Um, LaRue Milan has played at the youth Curry Cup level at those competitions and has even been in the wider super rugby squads, basically like the taxi squads, like if somebody gets injured, you can be thrown into the team. But Jack Reeves has been impressing in the preseason. We've heard this from the lips of our strength and conditioning coach on the Scrum of the Earth podcasts. Um, he's a guy that has an impressive resume coming through the Gloucester Academy, has made two starts in the premiership. Um, and I'm giving the slight edge, the slightest of edges to Jack Reeves as being that other guy beside of Wayne in the center position. What do you think? Uh, I think that's probably correct. I think Jack Reeves is here to play um, on my club. 
longtime captain Corey Lang has a, a little saying he likes to throw out there uh, on the Thursday before a Saturday game. Players play, you know, <laughs> players play. Yeah. And I think that uh, I think Reeves is a player. I think he's going to play. Um, he is going to be out there. Um, like I said, Gloucester didn't send him over here to sit on the bench. That's right. Uh, he's got a lot going on um, in terms of his career potential. Um, I mean, we're talking about a guy who was already under contract for a, for a Premier League team. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. They just didn't quite have the room to play him as much as they wanted to play him. Yeah. Um, I wonder so. if, if the, the, the Free Jacks and Gloucester have an agreement that he will be playing, like as a starter and getting significant minutes. Now, this has no, I mean, so what I'm about to do is give a comparison to a video game that is not even the same sport. So buckle up, guys. <laughs> Um, so in FIFA, which I am addicted to, I love that game. Um, so if you loan somebody out or you, you know, whatever, you can recall them if they're not being played. If they're not developing in the game, you can recall them. There might be a fee involved for recall, but it is definitely right. possible. And if you bring in a loan E to your team, the, the parent club can be like, you're not playing this guy, so he's coming back to us. So right. there might be some sort of agreement in place with TK and the organization with Gloucester to say, like, if this guy's not going to be playing there, we're bringing him back home, so you need to play him. That's why he's there. So, I mean, I don't know that for a fact. We have not asked TK about that, um, but that's just my assumption is, you know, there's some sort of deal in place. Yeah. Um, so I, th- I think you're right. And then I think that, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's better to have three guys uh, as the primary competition for two spots than to have two guys who are the obvious – people sure. just from a team standpoint running practice keeping guys uh keeping guys competing um you know it's what motivates a lot of players to really dig deep and and give their best um and that certainly seems to be the case in the centers um i, I have been enjoying joking that one of my uh my new favorite player is one of these centers i just don't know who yet <laughs> Um, but probably one of them is really going to really gonna make an impact, yeah. um, and yeah. I'm excited to find out which one of these guys I dearly love. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it, it's a big question mark. We're kind of doing some guesswork here based on uh, resumes and a lot of speculation. So it could be that we are completely wrong, and in the first game of the season, it's somebody else in those positions, and you guys can tweet us and be like, guy, you don't know what you're talking about, but I could have told you that to begin with. We don't know what we're talking about. We're just – you know, having fun here, being fans and doing some guesswork. So uh, who you got for the wings? Um, so on the wings, um, we are looking at Paula Balacana mm-hmm. and Harry Barlow as our dedicated wings. Um, a couple of the guys who we already mentioned in the center, some of those six centers are also wings, guys who can play in the wing, Kale Hodson, and I believe Zach as well yes. Yes. has experience in the wings. So they are both center slash wing players. I don't, I didn't see anywhere that they have any fullback experience. So I would consider them center wings, but I could just be wrong. Maybe those guys have played at 15 as well. So Paula Balacana, we already talked about 5'11", 215, 28 years old. He's Fijian, um, impact guy. Uh, I see him... Um, He certainly could start. I see guys like that. There's a lot of value, I think, in bringing them in for the last 30 minutes where somebody who's been sprinting around the field for 50 minutes already has to now try to stop a fresh Paula Bellicana. (laughs) I think he is a really lethal sub to bring on. Um, We may see him in that role. Um, It really depends on the configuration of 10 and 15 as to who is available to play wing. And how they're going to get their most high value players out there. Um, you want to make sure Fife is out there. You want to make sure Barlow is out there. And um, you probably want to make sure Bella Khan is out there. But Mitch Wilson makes a really good argument for himself as well. So yeah. Barlow is the other wing, 5'10, 200 pounds. He's only 21 years old, playing for the USA it? Selects. He's English, friends with Jack Reeves. Um, and a guy who is a lethal finisher. Um, I think I, I picked him for top try scorer of the season. I think he's going to be starting every match that he's healthy. Um, those are your dedicated wings. Uh, I gotta tell for you, f- 
uh, sorry, uh, just no, in terms of, you know, what these guys bring to the table. I mean, Harry Barlow is a star in the making, guys. He's 21 years old. He's really embraced his American side. I think he's uh, his uh, profile picture on Instagram right now is like him wearing an American uh, – flag shirt i just love that about him man like he is he is full on like he's embraced his american heritage over here so yeah i, I yeah. hope to see him as an eagle one day so talented and to get paula um you know as you were saying earlier tk was told that you got to sign this guy or you're a fool three years ago or whatever the, the circumstances were you know he had what the most um tackle breaks uh last year yeah. in mlr like and most line breaks it is so scary uh th this wing room is so talented man yeah. yeah um and then beyond that we're looking at fullback so we have two players who spent a considerable amount of time back there dougie fife who's 6'2 210 31 years old he is our veteran. He's got eight Scotland caps. He played sevens for Scotland, um, played at Glasgow. Um, he right. is cool as a cucumber, incredible counter attacker, um, really valuable back there at 15. Uh, I really like him as a finisher on the wing. I could be yeah. wrong. Maybe yeah. I'm dumb. I, th I think he makes a really good last man. His acceleration is, you know, I wish we had good stats and like combine stuff we could point to to really compare this stuff mathematically. Yeah. Because when you watch Doug Fife, watch how he can be at a full sprint in two steps, two strides. And he is at like his top speed. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, it is beyond difficult to defend a guy like that. For sure. Uh, which is why I think it's really valuable uh, to have him out on on why or why i say i like him on the wing because when he's the last man especially with the defensive systems that teams play where they kind of are drifting or they're often letting the last man stay open and they're going to give some ground and come and try and smother and isolate him um, i think he can exploit that he also gets to insert into the attack at 15 too so yes. um you know it's not like when you're 15 you don't get to play in the attack but uh whether it's at wing or at fullback um, he's going to be out there. He's one of our Cadillac, you know, guys. Yes. Um, and you get you get the caddy on the field. Um, Oldest guy on the team at 31 years old. Yeah, which is remarkable. A lot of guys have a lot of teams have guys 34, 36, yeah, 38. Uh, yeah, yeah, like it's 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 pretty remarkable. I know you were doing some average age stuff uh, well, today. Yeah. We were talking about it um, for the forwards. We'll see. He pulls the average up in the backs a little bit. Um, but yeah, it, it's cool to have one of your senior guys be 31 years old. I wish um, I was 31 still. So. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's yeah. It's also funny to talk about 31 year olds as the senior guys on the right. I tell you what, um, we saw him in person, and we'll talk about that a little bit in the next segment here. But we saw him recently in person, and I gotta tell you, man, like his shoulder blades are huge. Yeah. I, I mean, he looks. He's just, he's unbelievable. <laughs> he's, he's yoked, man. He's an athlete. He's so yoked. It is wild. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Some people say, you know, with him being a, a fullback in that position, like, oh, we can't really kick. I, I mean, I don't really hold that too much against him because look at all of the other positives that he has. Yeah, you probably want to play him on the wing. But, you know, if you throw him back in the, in the fullback position as an attacking fullback, I'm not too, you know, concerned about him out there at, at 15. Yeah, and they even played him at 13 um, some last season, outside center. Um, he can play He can play in a lot of places, frankly. Yeah. Um, and he, he really performed well in all of them, I think. So where he plays I, is maybe going to be more a matter of who's available and healthy in the rest of the back line. Yeah. And where do you put him to maximize the quality of the players? Again, um, Mitch, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Mitch Wilson, I just want to mention as well as the other fullback. So 5'9", 175, 25 years old, um, Australian. He has also played in the USA selects. Um, you'll notice that's our fourth um, player mm -hmm. mentioned in, in the USA select squad um pretty awesome and mitch wilson is i think probably one of the toughest guys on the team i i could probably four or five times last year he fielded a kick 
that was just a very good kick and well yep. competed for by the other team where he had to pos- reposition um, or sometimes worse, just wait in one spot, just waiting for the ball to come down. He's already in the right place. Yep. And guys came down to level him. And yep. sometimes he made a good evasive move. Yep. Sometimes he just got drilled and didn't seem to care. Um, yep. He is tough as nails. For sure. And I really like watching him play. So um, Mitch Wilson is another guy that you'll see out there in the 15 slot. He's a utility guy. He can play in the wing. Mm-hmm. He can play 15. That's where we see him primarily those two positions. Um, I doubt we'll see him anywhere else really, but he's very capable in either role. Uh, this is kind of like where I make my graphics. I'm, I'm kind of like doubting myself a little bit because a lot of these guys, as you were saying, are utility players. They can play in multiple z- positions. So when I release these graphics, I'm sure there's going to be people that are like, wouldn't you want to have him in this position? Yeah, of course. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Right. The answer is yes. We, we want them, you know, because these guys can play multiple positions, but I have to put them in one graphic. Otherwise it looks a little strange. So um, right. yeah, yeah, for sure. What else we got here? Um, so, you know, we've talked about the transactions, uh, the new guys coming into the back line here. We've talked about the um, roster breakdowns of who we believe will be in starting positions on this team, who these guys are. Um, so on the next segment, we will be talking about, this is a little special thing that we thought up of randomly. Uh, we're going to be doing a North American uh, starting 15 for the Free Jacks. So Canada, Canadian and American uh, eligible players. We'll discuss that in the next little segment here. So I've got one word to get us out of here in three, two, one. Huzzah. Huzzah. Huzzah, Rangers. This is Phil Harris again here at the Jacks Rangers Show. I am joined, as always, with our buddy Dave McVeigh, Outrider Dave, Big Brain Dave, Diamond Dave. He is here with us. How the hell are you, David? I'm doing well. How are you, Phil? Not too bad, my friend. So today we're going to discuss our North American 15. So this is just a fun little thing that we have done here. It's kind of a random thing that we've talked about. We wanted to throw into this episode. Who is our position that are either Canadian or American qualified for the entire team. So some of these things are going to be a little wacky. We understand that because we're trying to fit them into positions that maybe they don't necessarily naturally fit into, but we're just trying to make a full North American squad for our free Jacks just for fun. Um, Before we get too far into that, I did want to mention, uh, just give a a, a huge thank you. Uh, We are so filled with gratitude to, to the free Jacks for having us out to their theme party for the 2022 season. Um, Awesome event. We got to meet all the players, you know, that we haven't met previously or maybe that we have seen before. We, you know, we're talking to them again, um, hung out with some staff, just an amazing time. And I'm sure you feel the same way. Yeah, it was really cool to be included in that, um, to see their theme launch for 2022, um, get a little bit, a little taste of the player experience um, and how they run things operationally in terms of keeping everybody hyped up these themes are a pretty cool thing that a lot of teams do um year to year the season can get pretty tedious um just in terms of like getting stuck kind of in a cycle where you know you're just doing uh following the same mode week to week so these themes really help teams bring in a lot of energy and keep stuff fresh um we'll uh maybe work in some hints about the theme and you'll see players doing stuff out on the out on the field and things um coaches were saying it extends even to you know like the language they're using about like the names of uh, different locations they're not calling their headquarters the forge they'll be calling it the oh, mint yeah. Yeah, so yeah. that'll be that can be people's hint for today um but pretty cool it was a lot of fun and um really touching to be included in that by the team Um, cool to feel cool to feel like we're part of the group yeah Uh, and the players were so gracious i mean guys came over and talked to us for a long time yeah um getting to meet new guys uh we had a really long conversation with you and brummel the strength and conditioning coach nice guy um so yeah just tons of fun yeah, I mean, again, you know, they didn't have to do that by any means. Uh, you know, I just – it's so great that they've embraced this little show. I, we feel extremely lucky and fortunate that that is the case. So, yeah, awesome. Good times all around. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk in private, you know, I'm sure uh, at some – you know, throughout the season about that that experience. That was wild. Uh, there's some stuff we just can't tell you, but uh, it was – 
a lot of fun. <laughs> it was definitely memorable. Let's just say that. Um, so getting into our North American 15 for our free jacks, uh, I will let you take the front row, of course. Yeah, so um, I made a front row out of three of the new guys we have coming in this year who are all uh, American or Canadian um, qualified. These are three American qualified players. Alex Johnston could play loose head, American qualified. Yeah. Connor Robinson, um, BC hooker, one of our development contracts. Yeah. Can hook and Anthony Adam check uh, the twinkle toed tight head uh, can lock it down at number three. Another one of our draft picks and one of our development guys coming in this year. So I have a completely different front row. Um, and I was thinking like the, well, I want to put the best guys out there because I, I guess I'm just super competitive. I'm like, who are we going to play? We want our best players out there. So I had to put the Eagle in there. Um, just because, you know, he's representing the United States. You have to throw the Eagle in there. And then for Hook, I've got uh, DeWitt, of course, uh, the Canadian capped international there and newcomer uh, because he can play both uh, sides. So I've got him um, slotted in there. Um, for the flankers, I've got JJ uh, at starting at six and I've got Joe Johnston starting at seven. So our solid guys from last year, um, both USA qualified in the flanker position. What do you think? Yeah, I think those are solid. Um, six and seven choices. What would you have for the second row? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, Josh Larson, I've got, and his Canadian compatriot there, um, O'Gorman, is uh, starting uh, for four and five there. I apologize. You can take uh, Cam, or excuse me, <laughs> number eight. Number eight, Cam. Well, yeah, Cam. Cam Davidowitz, right? The development yeah. mystic player turned full contract guy who we'll see a few more minutes out of. Um, yeah, I think he's a great he's a great choice for number eight. I agree. Um, so who you got for scrum half? Holden Younger. Ah, okay. So here's where we differ a little bit. I wanted to put Yakubian in there because I know for a fact, because he's told about talked about this on our show, this little show here a couple episodes back. The vampire can play uh fly half in a pinch. He can play 10. So I wanted to get Yakubian some mini, minutes there at number nine because he is USA qualified and the USA qualified at the vampire at 10. I don't think it would be the, the prettiest game by any means that he would have back there, but you know, just to get those both of those guys work, I put um, those guys in there at those positions, nine and 10. Yep. Um, for uh, the centers, who you got? Uh, I said, I figured we'll have Mikel Lomano and Zach Bastris. Okay. So I put Kale uh, and Lomano on there uh, as the two starters. So we're pretty close there. Um, and for the wings, I've got Barlow on one side and Mitch on the other. Mm, I have I have Barlow on one side and Kale on the other. Okay, fair enough. Yep. So I kind of forgot about Zach, and I was like, who am I going to put at 15? So I really thought out of the box here, Dave. Uh, I mean, like hardcore. I'm like, you know, this guy played flanker like 20 years ago for USA. We'll just throw him in at 15 and, and ha let him have a go. We'll let him suit up. Uh, Mags is my starting fullback. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I like the outside the box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so that's what we just said is pretty close to what I had for my, my front row. Very different than yours, Alex, Connor, and Anthony. And then I also had in my first roster I created – uh, Javon Camp Villalobos at second row with Josh Larson. Um, okay. Everything else matches pretty well. Harrison Boyle at 10, I had. Holden at 9 to Boyle at 10. Boyle's qualified. Oh, yes. Um, I keep forgetting about that. Yeah, that would have been. He that is, be, yeah. Sense, but, but then I thought, and this will shed some light, I think, on, on people I left out. I thought, what if we didn't have players who weren't already captured? You'd lose the Johnstons because they're not captured yet. You'd lose Boyle because he's not captured, mm -hmm. which just means has appeared for the country. Right now, they could play for New Zealand for for um, or for the USA, right? They, they qualify right. for both. Yeah. So it just really was an excuse to make a second roster. And here's what's cool is we have enough players for a completely different type five. Kyle Sequeira. Yep. Foster DeWitt and Spence Kruger yep. could be your front row. Okay. Totally different than the last front row I named. Mm -hmm. You could have Regan O'Gorman, who I left out, and Mackay Winward, Winyard, who yep. uh, is our 18-year-old development uh, contract at four and five. And I didn't leave Quentin Newcomer out 
out of disrespect, I left him out because his moment to play open or blindside flanker has come. Quentin Newcomer gets to play six. He's locking it down in the back row, shutting down those blindside runs off the pick. I want to see him smash somebody off a of scrum. <laughs> Justin Johnson at seven, moving across to the open side. And who but Josh Larson has earned some minutes at number eight. What? Let Josh <laughs> Larson take a few rumbles off the back of that scrum. Let's get weird. I really, yeah, I liked is... this because it's, you know, an exercise in like getting weird. It's a little like throwing yeah. together a club rugby roster when you got guys at a wedding, you know, you're like, okay. well, we're missing five guys. We're going <laughs> to have to get weird. Um, and then uh, Sean Yacobian got love for me in my second roster. There I said Pon- Sean Yacobian to Pat Shee, yeah. nine and ten. And then I'd say you could have Holden on the wing. Okay. Just make him run. It's basically just punishment. Sure. Uh, Mika and Zach in the centers, Kale at the other wing, and Mitch Wilson still locking it back down in the fullback slot. And all of that is just mostly to say, look at how much young American and Canadian talent we have on this team. It's such a cool thing. Yeah. Um, if you go read like the the comments, which just as a general rule, I discourage the <laughs> reading of comments. But if you go read the comments on social media, on stories about the league, you'll run into people saying, you know, oh, there's not enough American players. They're bringing in guys from overseas. Right. Now, I know curmudgeonly people who are like, oh, I won't be a fan unless every player is, you know, uh, a domestic mad about imports they call guys imports and i think it is a load of horse manure Mm. we just made two mostly different american and canadian rosters out of just the free jacks team you know you're talking about 20 guys that they are developing into professional rugby players and some of those guys are coming from other places in this list yeah but they're all qualified at the very least to play for the u.s or canada yeah. Um, and this is what is going to improve rugby in the United States yeah. um, and Canada. And this is why I think the league is so exciting for rugby in the U.S. Like, yeah, it's cool for it to get more popular. It's cool for there to be a league that people can make money on players and owners. Yeah. Um, but it'd be it'd be real cool if our national teams got a lot better. Yeah. And this is how it's happening. So. I think it's just really neat. Mostly it's an excuse for us to talk about how many players there are who are developing and improving in this system. And it's an excuse to make a graphic, uh, which is a a huge part of this whole process. Everybody (laughs) loves a good graphic. Oh, yeah, for sure. So I'll definitely work on this after this segment at some point soon. And we'll get, I'll send you over my, my, first pick 15 i made a i made a third <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> out of the two i created um okay uh yeah so so dave has, has really embraced this whole process which i appreciate of course um it, there's a couple guys that i forgot about which I, I i'm apologizing immensely that i did but um you know uh, harrison boyle um friend of the show for sure so i left mm-hmm. him out at 10 which is a huge mistake but anyway um that is our north american 15 um, pretty good picks, I think, all around. And yes, th- this league, just look at the Free Jacks roster, as you're saying. These guys are solid youth, you know, American and Canadian talent that will be a part of this league for a long, long time to, to come, fingers crossed. And they will develop into great internationals. And that's really the whole point of this league. Um, and when you bring in the inter- uh, the um, internationals, the imports, whatever the hell you want to call them for these curmud- curmudgeons, as you're talking about, well, they sharpen, iron sharpens iron, right? So you've got these guys with some experience coming into the league and, and helping these kids along. So it's just to the betterment of our inter- international uh, hopes and dreams as USA Eagle fans and Canadian fans out there. I'm sure there's a few that might listen here. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's all good. It's all good all around. So, yeah, those curmudgeons, y'all sit down and have a coat for a while. <laughs> All right. Cool your jets. Yeah, cool your jets. All right, that's all we got for you at this point. Um, And I've got one word for everybody in three, two, one. Huzzah. Huzzah. Woo. Huzzah, Rangers. This is Phil Harris here at the Jacks Rangers show. I am joined by the big boss, the main man of the Free Jacks, 
CEO, Alexander Magglesby. Mags, how the hell are you? Great, Phil. Thanks for having me. You're welcome, Mr. my friend. Ranger himself. Yes, the original, the OG right here. Um, tell us, uh, for the Rangers out there that may have missed our previous interview, give us the convinced, uh, the condensed version of your personal and rugby background, please. Sure. I was uh, quite fortunate that my high school had not only rugby, but really, really high level rugby uh, growing up in Salt Lake City, Utah in the 90s. I played for Highland and we were kind of perennial national champions. So I learned the game fairly young. All our older brothers were involved and um, uh, great coaching with Larry Gelwix and a bunch of great assistants. We all played football in the fall and wrestled basketball or skied in the winter and then in the in the spring we played football and of my generation four guys went to the nfl so some real athletes we traveled the world you know that was my introduction to, to rugby as a global game uh which which was fantastic so that's i started playing in high school I, I just was very lucky that that existed and then um played in college with at a program that has had a long long history of of great rugby and that's at dartmouth uh in new hampshire and then I was, um, I started playing for the U.S. while I was still in college and then continued to play. And that was at the same time that the game went professional. Yeah. So you were yeah. actually able to kind of piece things together and make a career out of it. So um, wow. pretty cool timing. In, in yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're a legend in USA rugby uh, circles, of course. Um, you know, one of the best. And now you're the, uh, the Free Jack CEO. So, you know, you've, you've transitioned into this role what are your thoughts on fan representation in professional teams like board of directors? And is that something that has been talked about with the Free Jacks or would be considered by the Free Jacks down the line? Well, yeah, I think any organization is only as good as the people involved in the organization mm -hmm. and sports. And I don't know if you listen to Full Contact CEO, the podcast we run, but yes. you know, there's a lot of great conversations that happen, happen around the sports entertainment space. Um, and what really comes out of all those conversations at the end of the day is it is always and number one about the fan and the fan experience. And the value of this is the, the monetary value is derived from the numbers of those and the commitment of those fans and the experience that then is provided to the community is, is driven by the experiences they have, which then you know, brings for our game to more and more people, which is the ultimate goal because we truly believe it's it's a game changer for communities um just the values of the game and whether you play the game or watch the game that experience is, is something that is, is pretty magical for all of those who's who've been able to participate in it in time um so having voice is really important it's just how that voice comes comes out mm -hmm. and there's multiple ways that happens and i and hopefully you feel that you know, you have a voice and, and other fans have a voice in, in um, how this thing continues to improve. Mm -hmm. You know, I think after the end of every match that, you know, kind of starting the season, let me know personally um, what is working and what is not. And then we'll try to adapt. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's again, it's going to what our fans want um, and what our members most importantly want. Um, and that then, you know, we can... Uh, make changes happen for sure yeah I mean a fan ambassador might be something to consider down the road and and no better person than spider to fill that role potentially <laughs> just wanted to throw that in there real quick um, what is your favorite moment from last season for for the Jacks and tell us your overall impression of the first full season in MLR for the Free Jacks you know, it's interesting. I was down at Union Point the other day and a bit of a nostalgia about um, kind of some of the experiences that we all went through together when we were going through really COVID limited experiences. Um, operationally, we were massively under the pump um, and trying to adjust as quickly as we possibly could. And parking lots were flooding and fences were falling over and just all of the things that you could think, you know, generators were blowing up. So broadcast is being affected. So we were, we were constantly problem solving mm -hmm. uh, as an organization that made us uh, a lot better yeah. uh, having gone through that. But there was, there was some nostalgia because we did go through that. And the, how we got through that was because we had, you know, at the time we had a limit of 1,200 fans, but there were 1,200 massively passionate fans and members cheering on the team, mm -hmm. participating, just so happy to be back, back out to get together. Yep. Um, you know, so certainly those experiences, very happy moments. Um, 
and it, and it helped that we were winning, right? Yeah. yeah. And then finishing the season at Veterans, our new home, and being able to go through that test and successfully go through that test and realize that this is, there are so many opportunities with that venue. Mm -hmm. And we're really excited to continue to see I'm going to cough, um, uh, build up in that venue. And just that the, that experience, the intimacy of it, you're kind of on top of the game there. Everybody's crowded in. Um, the noise reverberates, the smells of the barbecue, and just the fun we had. You know, I think that was, excuse me, <coughs> um, pretty awesome. Yeah, I mean, everybody that I've spoken to really, really had a great time at uh, Fort Quincy, as we're calling it, Veterans Memorial Stadium, and are really looking forward to that venue to host the Jacks for years to come. Um, that's just a part of, you know, one of many things that makes this so exciting with the coming season, for sure. This next question uh, comes from our guest outrider, Chris Lind. Um, he says, the themed home matches uh, were an awesome idea. What themed weekend are you personally looking forward to the most? Right. Well, I wanted a Ted Lasso theme and my, my team uh, turned me down. So, oh, darn. Uh, yeah, I know. I know. I know. Um, so that would have been my favorite potentially. I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to the first one because that's really sets the standard and what, what can we then build on from there? Right. And, um, you know, that's, that's middle of March, March 12th. Yep. And we get a host Toronto. Um, rumor has it, we're going to have very special kit for the occasion. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it'll be, um, that, that'll be a great way to start. I'm really, really then looking forward to the app rugby and seeing how we, you know, like, can we really deliver on having, you know, a group in a hot tub and, you know, music that's a bit funky and yes. just really help make that a really great experience. Um, we'll also be hosting a collegiate seventh tournament around that, which will be really fun. Oh, nice. Uh, the world's greatest and largest unicorn party. Um, if, if again, we pull it off, yeah. uh, will be, uh, will be fantastic. The music on the jazz ska festival. There's one of my favorite new England ska bands will be playing. Um, Ben Skull of M will be post-match, which will be really awesome. And I just think they all have their own unique flavors, but that first one I think will be really good for us. As for an sure. Yeah. Hoping for a sellout there. I mean, what better way to celebrate St. Patrick's Day in the Boston area than going to a rugby match? I mean, it's just a no-brainer, right? <laughs> exactly. And, you know, there's a couple of Friday night matches, which will be really different for us. Yep. Um, you know, that, that one with Atlanta in the middle of May. And then, of course, ending the last game of the regular season, hosting uh, New York on a Friday night, that, the Ruck and Shuck. That also could be really unique. For um, sure. We yeah. haven't done those Friday nights, and that may be a different demographic. And it's you're coming, you know, you're jumping on the red line from the city. And right. um, not to say that it also won't be family friendly, but it just, given that it's a Friday night, that may yep. be different, maybe a different demographic. People More are young professionals in the house, perhaps. Yes. Yeah. 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 For sure. Um, yeah, looking forward to that one as well. You know, anytime that we can play New York at home and hopefully beat them, it's just, it's just icing on the cake. <laughs> um, so next on here, we have a question from co-host Dave McVeigh, who was unable to join us, unfortunately, this morning. Um, has there been any movement on ways to temporarily paint over the football lines at Veterans Memorial Stadium? Yeah, so I was at Veterans yesterday. It was blustery and we were continuing to have the conversations about the best way to do that. Um, in the, when we tested it out this summer, there was a water-based paint. Uh, and as you remember, that week was raining the entire time. So the crew literally painted it and repainted it every day and it would wash away. Oh, um, no. And it was the wrong color green. So it didn't, it didn't, you know, provide the right uh, experience for what we're, what we're aiming for. Yep. So uh, we're looking more at an oil-based paint uh, that's more perhaps permanent for the spring season. Okay. Uh, the city of Quincy, uh, the f that as a football venue for the high school teams in the fall is really, really important. Yep. And we have massive respect for that. So sure. can we, can we cover them up for, for our spring season really well? So we only have to do touch-ups and of course it's the right color green. Um, but we were, we were um, digging into that uh, yesterday, in fact. So that is a, it is a top priority uh, for all of us on the team and the organization. Perfect. Yeah, I know that's a, a burning question that people have regarding the new stadium. Um, so I'm going to open up the floor to you, my friend, um, to talk to the Rangers out there. Anything that you want to say to them 
prior to the start of the season. Yeah, just a first a quick shout out to our staff. Uh, they've worked exceptionally hard uh, in some probably trying situations over the last year. And I think what they're producing heading into this year is, is super exciting, you know, starting with the on-field experience, the on-field product, um, you know, TK continues to grow and um, is really coming to in, into his own running rugby ops. And we have two great coaches now um, running the show and, and Scotty and Mike and some real leaders that have been around now in the playing group uh, who have really grown, you know, Josh uh, has gone leaps and bounds since, um, you know, that, that original 2020 year when he joined us. And there's a lot of leadership like that now coalescing with some quality talent that's, that's joined the team. So I'm really excited to see their growth this season on the field. And then off the field, we've expanded dramatically and we'll be making an announcement in the next week or so in that regard. Um, something that we're really, really excited about that continues to drive towards what, we're, what we set out to do in 2018 which is create a world-class, you know, sports entertainment company that builds better communities through the sport of rugby football. And um, we've made some moves uh, recently that I'm really excited to announce that um, will have a profound effect on our ability to continue to drive towards a world-class experience for our fans um, and additional staffing and world-class staffing and ticketing and uh, marketing and operations and all the things that we need to do to continue to, to, to be that entity. So that'll be really exciting. Uh, but again, it's, that's what we're driving towards and some real significant changes there. Um, super exciting. It, it's, it's all very exciting. I think in the last episode, episode 24 that we had, we probably said exciting like a hundred times. So. Woo! Exciting! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, um, my favorite, thing. maybe my favorite moment was that photo we took with um, George and you guys and just that, but that encapsulated on the air. Oh and, yeah. Thank you for taking that photo, by the way. It dawned on me afterwards, like we should probably should have had you in the photo, but you know, it is what it is. That's great. And, we, and the only thing that was missing was Woody. So. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Good point. That's um, my, that's one of my biggest disappointments of this year is that Woody's kind of like gone into a cave and we're not seeing enough Woody. Yeah. And so. You know, hopefully we'll, the, the, the re-emerging of Woody will happen here pretty soon. Yeah, you got to coax him out somehow out of the cave. Mm -hmm. So the next thing, well, the final thing, rather, is the one word association. So I kind of ripped this off from you on your podcast. Um, <laughs> the first one on here is actually a, podcast. <laughs> the first one on here is Savannah, uh, Savannah Bananas which is, um, I'm aware of them, but you had uh, one of their folks, the president, I believe, on yeah, your show. Yeah. Entertainment. So, oh, yep. I agree. Uh, the next oh, one is yeah. MLR Commissioner George Killebrew. Champion. <laughs> Gil Gronies. What is that again? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we're still trying to figure that out. Um, Dougie Fine. Friends, friends in the league. Friends in the league. There you go. Friends. Dougie. If it's not Scottish, it's crap. <laughs> <laughs> So you and I right. uh, share a different kind of bond as well here. I didn't realize this until recently. We're brothers of Theta Delta Chi. Uh, for turn. Yes. So that is my next one on here. Theta Delta Chi. What's the first word you think of? Omicron. Yeah, there you go. Dartmouth uh, is the next one. So Dartmouth. Uh, the big green. Yes, sir. And final thing here is Jack's Rangers. Uh, making the future happen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Yeah. I agree. Uh, we're trying our best over here. So this was really awesome. We need to do a Jack's Rangers free Jack's tour of all our pub partners throughout New England. Love that idea. Love that. I'm, I'm down for that for sure. I'd love to. Is that better? All right. Um, so final thing here to get you out of here. I think you know what we're going to do. I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate your time. So we're going to get you out of here. But uh, there's one word that we have to say before we leave in three, two, one. Huzzah! Huzzah! Thank you. <laughs> That's right. Woo! All right, Rangers, that about wraps her up. Really enjoyed the segments in this preseason week two episode. Of course, always enjoy my time with my brother Mags. Great interview, great CEO, great organization. The best way to describe the Free Jacks and, and Mags. Before we get you out of here, as always, we like to discuss today in American Revolutionary War history. In 1779, Claudius Smith was hanged. Smith was a part of 
a group that used guerrilla tactics against Patriot civilians. So that was the reason for him being hung. But Revolutionary War quote of the day, I must study politics and war that my sons may have liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. That was John Adams with that quote. We will see you next week for the preview of the NOLA game. We're right there at the start of the season. That will come out next Tuesday, most likely, because that would be the 1st of February. And then on the 5th, of course, our boys travel down for the Battle of New Orleans against NOLA. Appreciate your time as always. Hang in there, Rangers. We're almost there, baby. Huzzah, saddle up, and we'll see you next time. Let's ride. Woo!